If I were trapped on a desert island and was allowed three pieces of media to take with me, I'd choose Dark Souls for being my favourite game, The Wire so I finally have an excuse to watch it, and the 2012 film Dread. Dread is a film I cannot stop talking about to friends, family, and on this channel. Not just because it's an enjoyable piece of cinema with a distinct 1980s throwback tone, but also because it's one of the most dense and intelligently put together films I've come across. If I had to describe this film, it would be like if someone made a spiritual successor to Robocop and accidentally left it in an attic for 30 years. It's layered, nuanced, and a glimpse into the future of comic to film adaptations. Dread showcased talents that would go on to do great things, and was also a film that was ahead of its time. Sadly, the price of this was a reception and response that highlighted how damaging marketing can be. I want to show you all why I love this film, reveal its depth, and why you should watch Dread. Dread was the brainchild of Alex Garland, an in-demand writer responsible for the genre-defining 28 Days Later and Sunshine. The decision to adapt Judge Dread to film again was puzzling, as the 1995 film had firmly poisoned the well. It's an entertaining film to go back and watch, but there was no denying that the general public associate the intellectual property exclusively with the film. It was a financial and commercial failure, with non-fans lambasting the acting and aesthetics, and fans tearing the film apart for its lack of respect for the source material. The most notable sin being that Judge Dredd goes most of the film with his helmet off. This is notable because early issues established that Dredd's face is mostly concealed, with an iconic panel establishing that his face will never be truly revealed. Judge Dredd is not so much a character as he is the embodiment of the unforgiving and unrelenting nature of authoritarianism. He is a man who goes by the book and doesn't budge an inch for anyone, no matter the circumstances. He sentences people on the spot, including prison time and execution, an extreme measure necessary for a world as unrelenting and fascinating as Mega City 1. The world of Mega City 1 is a cocktail of the strange and violent, open for any type of genre or element. This includes the genocidal dark judges from a parallel world, such as Judge Death, or little details like Devil's Island, a bizarre prison surrounded by some of the busiest roadways in the city, where prisoners are forced to bear the sound of lorries going 200 miles an hour 24-7. This is a land where drama, suspense, satire, and comedy can exist, and wouldn't look out of place if done well. This is the landscape Alex Garland had to work with. He even thought about adapting a well-known storyline known as Democracy. In the end, he decided on a simple premise, a day in the life of the unchanging judge. There would be very little character development for him, such attention going instead to Judge Dredd's staple, psychic Cassandra Anderson. She would be portrayed as a rookie, being exposed to the unrelenting and stubborn nature, of the justice system. While aiming to be as faithful as possible to the source material, it also scaled back the more outlandish elements to give a more grimy and realistic portrayal of the judge. This accurate portrayal was due in no small part to the guidance of Judge Dredd's creator, John Wagner. He provided assistance to the script and acted as a consultant for the film. The result is the most brutal and unapologetic depiction of Judge Dredd and Mega City 1 in modern media with the simple story allowing itself to commentate on authoritarianism, the role of judge, jury, and executioner, and drug addiction. Everything you need to know about Dread is in the opening sequence. It's a film with a grimy, futuristic, industrial aesthetic, and rife with well-executed action and bloodshed. The main character is a by-the-books officer portrayed expertly by Carl Urban in one of the highlights of his career. It's truly amazing how much character one can portray with the smallest of canvases, this canvas being his voice, posture, and the lower part of his face. Carl Urban is a man who comes across as passionate about Judge Dredd, and is one of the more vocal supporters of some form of continuation. After watching this film, it would be impossible to imagine any other live-action portrayal of the Judge. 
The primary feature of this film is, most assuredly, the action, and I've said to many friends that Dread comes across as a faithful Robocop continuation. It's about a world where crime runs rampant, it features a near-unstoppable police officer, and it is incredibly violent. It wears its R rating on its sleeve, and the execution of the action is presented with a sense of visceral joy. As Alex Garland put it when describing the Judge Dredd publication, it's like watching an 18 certificate film when you're 12. It's bombastic, loud, gratuitous, and incredibly creative, making each situation and sequence different without compromise in a world that's indifferent to human life. There's a sense of safety and common sense being completely disregarded that even the feelings of empathy one feels towards a stranger is seen as getting in the way of functionality. One of the first scenes has what we would call a mass shooting, and it's treated in the same way that a minor car accident would be. Some police on site, cleanup conducted, and back to normal within the hour. No outcry, just another mundane and uninteresting part of the day. There isn't even an authority figure to pick up the bodies. They even call the vehicle that takes away the deceased a meat wagon. This is accompanied by Paul Leonard Morgan's masterful score, utilising synthesizers and distortion to create a sense of uneasiness, with moments of visceral intrusion. Even during quieter moments, there's a sense of impeding dread, from the vague heartbeat during the judge's initial investigation at Peach Trees, to the unworldly introduction of Rookie Anderson. Nothing is safe, and the score exemplifies it. When one considers Dredd himself, the atmosphere, the music, and the people's behaviour towards each other, Mega City 1 comes across as a prison no one can escape from. It's dangerous because people are trying to break free from the rules this fascist and unmoving government places upon them, while living in a world that is completely indifferent to human life. The only thing people are concerned about is trying to make the most out of the situation they are in. At any moment, they could fall off the radar, either through being caught in the middle of a violent situation, or being unfortunate enough to commit a minor crime in front of a judge. The film conveys a need for escape, which goes hand in hand with the sense of self-loathing apparent in its situation. Countering this are two factors that represent the breaking of the status quo. The drug slow-mo, and Rookie Anderson. If the slow-mo guys taught me anything, it's that almost anything can become euphoric when witnessed at a fraction of its speed, regardless of whether it's something as mundane as throwing eggs at a friend or jumping onto a trampoline full of mousetraps. It has a strange sense of beauty to it. It's that beauty that contrasts against the roughness of Mega City 1, where the psychedelic drug slow-mo not only forms the basis of the film's plot, but is also a catalyst for some of the most spectacular sequences in the film. There's a sense of tranquility to these sequences, where the visuals sharply increase the saturation, and the music slows down to properly convey the relief and relaxation these inhabitants crave. Music also conveys this wonderful hypnotic state, thanks in part to Leonard Morgan getting inspiration from Justin Bieber. No, I'm being serious here. In 2010, a composer under the name Varian released a slowed down version of You Smile by Justin Bieber. Listening to the two side by side, the inspiration is without question. The sheer beauty of slow-mo, no matter how violent it gets, is captivating for the audience, yet dangerous for the civilians, because in pursuit of escapism, they are forced to come in contact with dealers and suppliers. In this case, Mama, a brutal and hollow yet tragic figure who is completely indifferent to all life, including her top subordinates who she keeps under her wing. Lena Headey's range as an actress is now well established, but the early signs of portraying an unsympathetic and empty woman with complete disregard to human life are here in some of her introductory moments. It's astonishing how much she conveys with so few words, and the unexpected wrench in her operation adds a compelling sense of desperation that gets more extreme as time goes on. Slow-mo is the driving force of the story, and one of the few times where I feel the 3D gimmick 
truly enhances the film in terms of storytelling. With that in mind, one must not forget the human factor. The audience cannot engage with this world without something relatable to ground it, otherwise it's a series of admittedly well-shot action with moments of unflinching procedure. The film's appropriate anchor into the world is Rookie Anderson. Cassandra Anderson is the most relatable character in the entire film, a fish out of water who shouldn't be in the Justice Department. She was raised in a tower block similar to peach trees, a clear parallel to the apartment blocks that much of our population are familiar with. Her unique gift of psychic abilities become enough of an interest to at least allow the Justice Department to give Anderson a trial shift to see if she can handle the tough responsibilities that being a judge entails. Despite being completely unqualified for the job, she's good with information, vital in providing small moments of exposition to the audience, and is intelligent to the point that she knows precisely what procedure calls for, even if she needs some prompting. But her biggest weakness is her exposure to violence or murder, with her first raid showcasing uncertainty and anxiety, to the point that she doesn't fire her gun once during the raid, a conclusion you can easily draw upon, since Judge Dredd tells her bluntly that she doesn't look ready. It is through her that we slowly become exposed to just how much of a toxic hotbed this mega city and those self-sustaining tower blocks are, and why the procedure of the Justice Department not only dehumanises the judges, but also the civilians. A moment that initially took Anderson and me as a viewer off guard was a small action sequence on the stairwell. The judges are trapped within the tower block of peach trees and are dragging a suspect in tow. You would think the first priority would be to ensure the safety of high-valued persons and escape the block, but instead the top priority is her assessment, meaning that Anderson and bright-eyed rookies are almost expected to be in the situation regularly. As Dredd put it, it's all a deep end. Anderson is a perfect contrast to Dredd, whereas one is someone who would follow a strict code to their final breath, Anderson is someone who comes to terms with how judges actually operate, and bit by bit is becoming shaped by her experiences. And it's at this point where I'm going to have to put a spoiler warning. I know I've said a lot about this film, but I'm going to delve into major details in terms of content. If you haven't already, go watch the film, or skip to this time code. Otherwise, here we go. The major turning point for Anderson comes as she is kidnapped and held at the mercy of Mama. At this point, she understands the strict procedure of the Justice Department, and more importantly, that she is not bound to it. She has objectively failed her assessment due to the character she detained stealing her Lawbringer firearm, which is an automatic fail. No longer bound by the strict rules and knowing that the only way out is through Mama, she dispenses justice to perps that have broken the law by attempting to murder or conspired to murder a judge. Even though she has failed her assessment, she finally understands what it takes to be a judge, and even saves Dredd from being executed by corrupt judges hired by Mama, but this transformation is done without dehumanising her as a person. She's still that rookie with a dream to make an impact on the city, whether it be through fighting crime or by changing how the Justice Department deals with criminals. Enter the moment where the two judges find Mama's techie. If this were any other judge, they would have immediately sentenced him to the ISO cubes, or even death, for conspiracy to commit murder of judges, tampering infrastructure communications, and many other crimes that we might not know of. But we as an audience know that his actions were done under direct duress of Mama, with her presence alone being frightening enough to coerce him to continue to do her bidding. But Anderson's gift, as well as her humanity and understanding, prevents what could have become a continuation of unwanted torment, and instead gives him something that doesn't exist in this world. A second chance. Her arc culminates in her injecting a bit of humanity into Judge Dredd, without fear of reprisal, something that took a considerable amount of confidence to do, and effectively turned the tables. While the film has a faithful adaptation of a beloved law enforcer and throwback violent action at the centre, the backbone of the film is about the transformation of Anderson, from naive rookie with a heart of gold, to one who is determined enough to make a difference. 
despite how futile it might be. She didn't know she impressed Dredd enough to pass her assessment, her becoming a judge literally hinged on his word, and were this any other rookie in the same situation, it would have been an automatic fail. The two develop mutual respect for each other, with Dredd becoming a mentor figure for Anderson, and Anderson impressing Dredd with her development and confidence. At the end of the film, the implication is that everything that had just transpired is completely mundane. It's just another day on the job. The justice system is rotten to the core, with only the capacity to answer 6% of reports without making an effort to tackle the root problems this city faces, making it completely vulnerable to corruption. But Anderson's performance in her assessment, as well as her actions, provide a little glimmer of hope for the city. Even if she doesn't make a wide impact, she's going to make the most out of her position, as well as her abilities. Maybe that's what will end up changing the city from its bleak situation, to something more prosperous. This is why I am a huge fan of Dread. It's a wonderful throwback to guilty pleasure action titles, while also being dense with characterization and subtext, topped off with some of the best use of 3D I have ever seen. It's a film I love to the core, and one I immediately began to recommend to like-minded individuals and friends. It's one of the very few films I saw multiple times in the cinema. It was that transfixing. But anyone who follows the history of Dread will know how this story ends. Dread was a box office disappointment. It closed with $41 million takings against a $30 to $45 million budget not including marketing costs. Talks of continuations were off the table, and everyone involved ended up going in different directions. And that's a shame, because while Dread was ahead of its time, it was released in the middle of the most crowded superhero release schedule of the decade. Superhero and reboot fatigue had set in, with the first Avengers movie having released earlier that year to become the dominant superhero property in the film industry. We hadn't thought of the possibility of an R-rated superhero or comic film being successful in the 2010s, since the industry was more focused on marketability and making films accessible for a wider audience. If Dread had come out after the success of Deadpool, I think it would have done quite well at the box office, since that film made marketers aware that there was a very lucrative demand for more adult-oriented comic adaptations. And what also didn't help was that the marketing and distribution was a complete botch job. There was only one trailer that got any form of attention, and it portrayed Mama like a supervillain who wants to take over the city with drugs. It has a soundbite that didn't make the final cut of the film, where she talks about taking over the city, and is instead said by one of her henchmen while she looks blankly on. It even spoils two major plot points, one regarding slow-mo and the other being a major peak in Anderson's arc. Finally, this trailer doesn't tell me what the film is truly about. It's a confusing mess that makes the film look bland and generic, with some nice visual touches. The film lasted six weeks in US cinemas, and in the UK the distributors were adamant that the film be shown in 3D. 2D screenings were notoriously difficult to attend around here, and the sad result was that my best friend, who suggested we watch this film, had to wear the 3D glasses over her own specs. Like, I get it, the 3D in this film is bloody brilliant, but the last thing you want is to limit your audience, especially since the audience is already a very specific niche that doesn't gravitate towards 3D viewings. Carl Urban would go on record to say that the box office failure was a fault of marketing, and not the failure of filmmaking. There's also the narrative that The Raid Redemption, which came out on home release just one month prior and had a similar plot, damaged the potential revenue the theatrical release of Dread could have pulled in. This is a narrative I don't subscribe to. The Raid had a very limited release in March, and its wider weekend release in April had a take-in of around about $950,000. Dread did over six times that, and was more widely marketed. 
Batman. Some hope was restored when the film was released on DVD and Blu-ray, and the appeal of Dread became much more widespread. In a world of bland remakes, samey superhero films, and whatever the hell the reboot Robocop is, Dread was a wonderful reminder that twists on the formula can be appealing. Dread was unapologetically dense, creative, and violent, which was attractive enough for the film to make over $20 million in home release. The film's legacy persists through Rebellion Developments, who are the owners of the IP, and executive producer Andy Shankar, who would go on to have a hand in the bizarre yet fascinating Judge Dredd Superfiend. So, will Dredd continue? It's possible, but I'm not getting my hopes up. And that's why Dread is special. It's a glimpse of the past through a modern lens, and it's a wonderful relic of each participant's careers. Alex Garland would end up launching his directorial career with the fantastic Ex Machina, also starring Dom Hall Gleason, who would play General Hux in the recent Star Wars trilogy. Carl Urban's career would continue with the highly underrated Almost Human, Adi Shankar became the showrunner of the Netflix Castlevania series, and Lena Headey would become a household name as Game of Thrones entered its third season. Dread isn't the highlight of their careers, but it's a wonderful, violent look of how much range each participant has. This is why I love Dread, and why it's my favourite film of all time after all these years. Not just because it's fun, but also because of the many layers of characterization within its characters and also its setting. Lionsgate did it a complete disservice. It's up to us to give it the wider attention it deserves. And it's why you should watch this film. Hello, and thank you for watching this video. If I've convinced you to watch the film, taught you something about it, or even encouraged you to give it a rewatch, then please tell me so via your preferred medium, like Twitter or even the comment section. It's a film I've been itching to talk about, and I'm really happy with how it turned out, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Catch me on Twitter, or watch my best friend and I play random obscure adventure games on the Rachel Hudson YouTube channel. Once again, thank you for watching and for your continued support and have a good night.